I'm Dimitri Papadimitriou. I am the founder of the Migration Policy Institute. Um, the institute is located in Washington, D.C., but um, we also have a sister institution in Brussels called Migration Policy Institute Europe. Um, I stepped down as president of MPI, the overall operation, last July, but I have retained um, responsibilities for MPI Europe. So I am president of MPI Europe, and I'm a senior um, distinguished fellow for the Migration Policy Institute in Washington. And we basically do everything that has to do with migration. Um, that includes humanitarian issues, refugees, protection issues, but also straight immigration policy. Um, we work a lot on conditions from which people are fleeing, uh, protection issues, pretty much everything that you would imagine that has something to do with the movement of people. The Mediterranean story is a very old one. You know, it's been going on now for about 10 or 15 years, perhaps a little longer than that. Um, I recall that uh, 15 years or so ago, Mediterranean was called by certain analysts and certainly the press as the Rio Grande for Europe, um, which of course evokes the image of the, um, the river that separates Mexico from the United States. And that, um, uh, that particular border in the south of the United States has been a place in which roughly about 300 people die each year trying to make it into the United States. The numbers are slightly less now. There were slightly more, you know, in the 1990s, late 1990s, but the fact remains that people who are trying to breach borders, whether it is the Rio Grande or the Mediterranean, often lose their lives. It is a horrible human rights and humanitarian catastrophe. It creates hate and a chaos and it makes it very difficult for governments to respond in real time, as it were. Now, it is important for also, also for us to understand that every time that a country is up in the ante, in other words, increases the enforcement at its borders, it is incumbent upon that country to make sure that that up in the ante of the enforcement does not lead to additional loss of life. And I think, you know, Europe has been failed in that regard um, when the Mare Nostrum operation of the Italians ended late last year and it was replaced by a much lighter uh, both enforcement and search and rescue operation by Frontex that has led to additional people dying but it has also led to many more people attempting to make the crossing. And this is something that we also need to understand, that on the other side of the border, in this case, on the other side of the Mediterranean, are hundreds of thousands, probably a million plus desperate people who are egged on by profiteers, you know, smuggling syndicates that make an enormous amount of money and pay none of the consequences. Translating, you know, the kind of advocacy that we do, which is policy advocacy, problem-solving advocacy, we remind people something that they know very well, which is that they have humanitarian obligations that they must obey, they must respond to, but we also remind them that they have responsibilities toward protecting their societies, that they have responsibilities toward listening to their electorates. And what we do, in a sense, is engage with policymakers at all levels in Europe. Again, because Europe makes decisions very, very slowly, it's very difficult for us to say X. In other words, we made recommendation X and it has led to Y. But over a two or three year period, frequently X does lead to Y. 
Yes, I'm not a terrific fan of much more Europe, okay? But in this instance, Europe has to come together. The finger pointing between member states and Brussels has to stop. We have to stop talking about solidarity and we need to start to start actually doing, implementing solidarity. Perhaps the perfect parallel to what is going on today with regard to the crisis, the Mediterranean crisis, etc., etc., or the various crises, may very well be the Euro crisis of the last three or four years. It took about three years before Europe got its act together to agree on creating, in a sense, more Europe on the issue of the Euro. So it may take, unfortunately, almost as long for that responsibility sharing that we talked about earlier to get to a point where it makes a real difference in the lives of people. And by that, I mean both the people who are trying to seek refuge in Europe, but also the national publics, the electors, the people who basically say, yes, we're humanitarians at heart, we'll take more refugees, but we want an orderly process so that we know who is coming in, so that the people who are coming in have been vetted, this way we're not importing people who might wish us ill, and so that we feel that we have the resources, political, social, cultural, and money, to actually begin to integrate these people. And we're still, unfortunately, very far away from getting to that point. If the only way to motivate the European Union, the collective, you know, the heads of 28 states to come together and make some good decisions in this regard, if the only thing that it takes is deaths in the Mediterranean, I'm afraid that the European public and perhaps even, perhaps even newspapers and the news media may become inured to small losses of life. In other words, you know, there is no one who reports on or gets excited about 20 more people drowning, 70 more people drowning perhaps a hundred people more drowned. We saw that in the United States. If the losses of human life at the southern border of the United States uh, were, you know, 20 or 30 people, 10 or 15 years ago, it would make the headlines in the biggest national newspapers. Now, the same three or 400 people die in the southern border, there is hardly any reporting of this. It's become part of what is expected that will happen down there. And we don't have loss of life that involves a hundred or a hundred and fifty people. So I hope that we're not moving in the direction where we ignore fifty or a hundred people die and only respond to when eight hundred people die. That would be a humanitarian catastrophe. If the number of people who are trying to cross the Mediterranean or the Aegean or land borders or any other place continues to increase, then Europe may decide to take a real good look at something that several uh, uh, ministers of the interior in the DG Home and Migration Council. In other words, you know, the Director General in Brussels that is responsible for those issues, borders, migration, etc., etc., it may actually get serious about creating joint processing centers outside of European space. In other words, it may find itself with its back against the wall and realize that it may be able to accomplish more of its goals that are more consistent with its values, 
by processing people and examining people's claims elsewhere, outside of European space, in effect, decoupling, taking apart the fact that if you reach European space of vessels that are European, fundamentally you are in Europe. Because that has provided an extraordinary incentive for the syndicates, for the smuggling syndicates, to actually say, we'll charge you extra, don't worry, we'll put you in these horrible boats, but at the first sign of trouble, just basically say, come and save us, we're about to sink. So the incentives have become completely perverse. That is why the smugglers are winning. That is why we're losing so many lives. But again, Europe will not do this unless or until it feels that it has no other option. Europe is sitting in a neighborhood that will only get worse. If we think that we have problems today with the five or six countries that are producing significant numbers of people fleeing for opportunity, for saving their lives, for creating a life or attempting to create a life for themselves and their families, or simply trying to get out of horrible situations, that number of people will only increase. So I don't want, you know, nobody can look 30 years from now, but I will be fairly certain that five years from now to 10 years from now, there will be more instability in the neighborhood. There will be greater challenges to Europe. It will force Europe to begin to think and act as a single space. It will force Europe to do things that it hasn't wanted to do. But I do not think that everything should become European, Europeanized. This issue has to become much more European.